Pulled up to the scene in a 65 Bentley, dripped in Brioni, China doll with me, looking like a supermodel, oh what a feeling, 25 years old, 25 million, today's the audition for the Godfather part, my life's already a movie so when do I start, I walk up in Patsy's East 119th Street, Fat Tony Salerno gets a kiss on the cheek, I know my way around, not my first time here, been doing overnight cigarette loans for 10 years, I say hello to Danny Pagano and Tough Tony, Nicky Domino gives me a nod, they all know me, they ask why I'm there so early, I say the part, they say what part? I say the movie, why not? I don't look like Carlo, they all begin laughing 3 p.m. ready for the lights, cameras, action Gianni, get in your zone My name is Gianni Russo, a.k.a. Carlo The infamous son-in-law from The Godfather I'm now known as the Hollywood Godfather And this is my story Walking with a limp like will I ever run? Once again, or is this it? Am I forever done? Living in the hospital was never fun. Some people were cool, but not everyone. Welcome, know. everybody. It's time for another Hollywood Godfather podcast. And these are the shows we really love. The Mailbag. Here where you want us to talk about what shows you would like us to record. And that's what we're going to do now. First, we have to say hello to the great genie uh, who's now with us forever. Thank God. And genie and our co-pandre over here, Pat, my man. Hey, how's everybody doing? Uh, Jeannie, you still there? I'm here. I'm right okay. here. Hello, everybody. All right. Hi, All right. All let's, right. Let's start it off. All right. Well, with mailbag today, these are for are from Stefano, and they're for you today, Pat. This first one here, it says, I have a book recommendation, The Last Boss of Brighton, a true crime book that tells the rise and fall of notorious Belarusian Jewish mobster Boris Nayfield, as well as the history of so Soviet emigre organized crime in the United States. Yeah, That's I heard of the book. That, uh, <laughs> well, you know, when somebody recommends books, uh, one, you know, they're either recommending it because they think I'd like to read it or, you know, Johnny or you would like to read it. But uh, often, if it's good, we will try to reach out to the author to get him on the show, because we don't like to we don't like to review books. I mean, you know, people can they want it; they can read it themselves. But yeah, I I made a note of that, and I'm going to try to uh, reach out to the guy, see what he has to say, and it will come on the show. Awesome! All right, and Stefano was uh, happy to talk to us. So again, hi Pat, it's me again. I've got another guest recommendation. Nicola Talliant, she's an Irish, Irish investigative journalist specializing in organized crime. Have you guys heard of her? No, but uh, I will check her out. And if she has something to say, we will extend the invitation. Fantastic. Yeah, you know, usually, usually anybody who uh, has a book will talk to anybody that is, you know, stands still long enough. So you know, if, we, if we invite authors, they generally come on. Well, it says she's traveled to Siberia, Romania, Spain, Belgium, Hong Kong, the Philippines, uh, ch chased criminals through the UK, investigated murders and set up. He has. She has done this. Yeah. She uh, should so become a tour guide instead. Right. <laughs> she, stay alive. Well, she, she was setting up stings and seeking out wealth of those who made their money from crime. She's trying okay. to get her own Rico thing going. She, she sounds like she's done a, a lot of running around and got to see a lot of great places. Well, she sounds like she has a lot to say. I will talk to her. And um, someone suggested the cartel, the Kinahan cartel as an episode topic. Sounds good. I'll look into it. All right. Well, I have a question. Can I throw a question in here? I realize I didn't, I didn't email it in this time. Okay. Uh, my question was, um, I was going to ask Gianni, my people have been saying a lot about that the Mormon church is uh, owns a lot of the properties now in Las Vegas. Always have. Always have. Always have. They've been involved in it for years and years and years. That's what do they own? Perry, you know, Perry Thomas, Perry Thomas, who is the head of the Valley Bank down there, is Mormon. They're all moments. I mean, Bradley Panos was a partner of mine in my hotel wow. in the 80s. 
Gianni, do they own casinos, hotels, or both? They they own the properties, and they don't they can't operate them because it's against the religion. Yeah, okay, so but they own the properties. Okay. They, they do leasebacks. They're very smart yeah. business people. Oh yeah. Got, oh, yeah. yeah. Hey, religion has nothing to do. You know, it's it's crazy. It's, it's, it's a green, right? <laughs> There's Catholics that own casinos too. I mean, we're talking about everybody. The Jews. How many casinos they own? That religious the Mormons, beliefs have nothing to do with a casino. The Mormons. There. Well, I had a sister-in-law that was quite quite religious, and her her daughter told me she said we walked into a casino one time, and her mom said, "Look at all that sin." <laughs> and I was like, "Oh my." I love going to the casinos. I've always loved it. And and Gianni, I've I've said it before. Back when you said everyone went in and was dressed so nice, and oh, I yeah. just used to love that. And walk. I, I, I turn down invitations to go to Vegas now. It's That's so, what you've said, yeah. which is too bad because I I would yeah. love love to go see that. I'm dying to get to the Mob Museum, which is not open all the time because every time I've gone there, it's been closed. But really, sooner or That's later. Funny. Maybe I'm going. It's open seven days a week. I've well, been there numerous times. They they actually tra treated Pat and I very well. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, the Mob Museum has been very generous to us. As well, far I as hope they want you back and to bring your new friend, and we could all do one for, do a podcast from the Mob Mob Museum. Oh, they'll invite us anytime we want. Yeah. Hello. Bye -bye. yeah. All right. So I'm really excited uh, by this email. This is from Carol Waltman. And Carol is um, part of the John Nail and Dennis Duchesne group that are podcast about the gentleman who is in prison, has been in prison 35 years, our episode from a couple weeks ago. Oh, yeah. And she said, John Nail is the savior. Hi, after watching this podcast, Mercy, I have a few things to fill in that John may not have been able to answer. I have kept this case alive for 36 years. Dennis Deshane was our childhood friend. Um, since the time of death, oh, I don't know, science. Oh, science and time of death excluded. Sorry, it's kind of out of order. I can give you tons of information on the alternate suspect. He was a stepdad of the little girl, Sarah Cherry. He was to go on trial for molesting Sarah's stepsisters the day after Sarah was found. All charges were dropped against him. The judge was a crooked sob and, oh, I think she meant SOB. But she didn't have to. You forgot to separate those for me. But I know I SOB it. when I see it. Uh, the, stepdad <laughs> threw, uh, the stepdad knew the judge and all the charges were dropped. She started trial and error in 1989 after the trial and knew the system was failing. And she just said um, she, she is on Facebook and her Facebook is called Justice for Dennis and said, um, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you a thousand times. Oh, we were, she's very welcome. Uh, but it would, you know, Jenny and I spoke about uh, something similar uh, when we were talking on the phone a few days ago. Uh, we did two shows on, on, this, uh, on this guy, and that's probably enough. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, when you do when you're doing a, a, a 40 minute, uh, approximately 40 minute show, you can't possibly get everything in that oh. has to be said, uh, particularly somebody that's that's been in the can for 35 years. 35 years. So oh. it, 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 the object of these uh, these attorneys and authors coming on talking about these cases is to get people interested. Right. So they can do the research themselves. Right. But, uh, no, we, we've done we've done two shows on this case and. Uh, well, that's probably thinking us. So yeah, no, no, I, I understand that. Uh, but no, we uh, understand it. But as you, as Pat's saying, we can't devote yeah, so ahead. many shows. I mean, the guy is in jail thirty six years. What they, what they need now is financing to reopen right. the case, and that's what they're trying to do. I mean, exactly. what, other than us writing checks, which we're not going to do, <laughs> I wish them luck. You know, go yeah, on. yeah. Right. Okay, next. She wanted to give us a quick shout out and a thank you. Um, this is from Hector. I recently went to Amazon to order a print of the sixth family and it's been removed from the site. Although the unabridged audio was still up there. What's up? Well, he didn't say who it was to. And I just want to say sorry, Hector, because I jumped on and I know I bought the last one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have that uh, it derived. 
Well, I guess you've got a collector's item there. Yes, uh, I do. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, we're working on a uh, deal with a company uh, that involves that story, uh, that book. And, and before we get too in-depth, uh, we're going to wait to see what happens rather than say it's going to happen or it may happen to give all the details out. And knowing this business as Gianni and I do, this business they call show, uh, things could turn on a, on a, on a dime and every, everything could fall apart or just the opposite. So it's, it's good luck to wait. And we are going to wait. We'll probably hear something within the next, what do you think, Gianni, about a month or two? Yeah, definitely. And it's, and it's worth the wait for you and I, obviously. Oh, it's definitely worth the wait. And, and we the apologize to everyone. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> yeah, we, we apologize to everyone because we didn't uh, announce that the book was coming down because we didn't know. Uh, the person. Oh, the yeah, company, no, we didn't know at all. Yeah, the company that we're dealing with uh, said, okay, take the book down. It was like a within five minutes, it was gone. But for some odd reason that I still can't figure out, they wanted to leave the audio book up. So we left the audio book up, but uh, this is going to be a very good deal for everybody, our, uh, our readers, uh, and uh, and us uh, naturally. But uh, well, especially like, for me. <laughs> especially for us. But uh, it's we will tell you exactly what we're doing when we think it's the right time, which will be in about a month or two, as soon as we hear back from them. Sounds great. Well, and Gianni, I did. Um, I got on there and it said one left, and I'm like one. <clears throat> hit that button real quick. Perfect. Great. Uh, I, I may be sending that your way for a little. Oh, whatever you want, please. Okay. Definitely. Be Thank my you. plan. And I'll make sure you get it back to uh, Yeah. yeah. yeah can do that. Up. I know the I know the drill. All yeah. right. So this is for Patrick and Gianni. Uh, this might be off topic, but I'm curious. I recently read a book on happiness how to attain it, and how, and why most people in America are unhappy. One of the reasons I've been a loyal listener to the podcast from its inception is that it cheers me up. You guys seem to be very content and happy. What's your secret? Being content and happy. <laughs> no. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start it out. Uh, yeah. What I do or don't do is I don't let I, – I, if there's something that I cannot control, I just forget about it. Uh, as an example, uh, not necessarily pertaining to me, but uh, so let's say, for instance, uh, you get fired from your job. You could spend the rest of your life bitching and complaining about that to everybody you see, making your own life miserable. Or you can say to yourself, if you can do it, and I suggest you practice it because we all have these similar situations. There's nothing I can do about this. I'm moving on. And that's that's how I stay Same. steady. I don't, I don't know if I want to use the word happy, but uh, when you don't have to worry about things that are needless to worry about, you're, you're automatically happier than you would be if you if you're brood about it. Exactly. Uh, and and that, 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 that comes into, you know, anything. You fail a test, uh, uh, you, you, your car breaks down, you got to fix it, cost a thousand dollars. And people complain and bitch for weeks and months. I ask why? I mean, it just is a waste of time and a waste of brain power. And it seems to make me more content. How about you, Jean? Me? You're all cheerful. I've known you a while, you know. I, I'm pretty cheerful most of the time. I try I try and just, one thing I've learned in life, it might be just awful and traumatic today, but tomorrow it's not really going to matter. You know what I mean? It's yeah. what you freaked out about last week. However, I have been bitching and moaning about somebody um Hitting my car. Hitting your car. Is, <laughs> we, we, I have, I have we didn't find that guy yet. No girl, whatever it is, we still don't know. I have done a lot of complaining, but it's in the shop, so I'm happy about that. Um, you know, I just try and stay happy. I just try and, you know, I have found being miserable and hateful does. It's just not worth your time. It's a waste of good energy. That's all exactly. it is. Exactly. And 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 you have your grandchildren, which is hard. Oh to believe. my gosh! Yeah. yeah. Those little grandkids that when you walk in the room, they go, Grandma Jeannie, and run across the room and hug you. I'm like, what could be wrong? There you go. You just How about you, Jim? Me, I have a, a very strange lifestyle because of the fact I don't let anything bother me. Yeah, I, after what I've survived in my younger years, 
I thank God every day I'm up and for what I have, not for what I don't have and bitch about it. <laughs> and that you want. You know, you, yeah. you and I had a, had a talk about this on the phone also. But those of you who aren't aware, he and I talk about four or five times a week, sometimes more. And one thing I wanted to tell him a couple of months back that I admire about Gianni is that he's always looking forward. Mm-hmm. You know, unless somebody asks a question about the past, they'll answer it. But, I mean, he doesn't live in, in the past, and a lot of people in his position would. I mean, the guy lived a life, let's face it. But since I've known you, and it's been years, uh, you always, always, without exception, are always looking forward to the next project, the next thing, the next party, the next phone call. You never complain about the past. You never dwell on it. And that's well, I'm very fortunate, you know, and that's, that's how I look at it. Too many people are dwelling on what they don't have. Be happy with what you have, and then you, if you're healthy, especially. So just be, you know, there's too many materialistic things get in the way of being well, a, know, a good life. It, well, that's one aspect of it, but you're unique in, in the fact that you're always literally looking ahead, looking toward the future. And, you know, so it's it's just odd. You don't find people with that kind of brain power, with that kind of personality that, that can do that. And I, uh, I, I picked up on that immediately. So, I mean, to answer the reader's uh, question, I think we, we answered. We all have our own ways of, of trying to find happiness, sometimes without even realizing it. Right. Uh, just look but, in the mirror. And look, talk to yourself about it. Yeah, talk, exactly. Talk about the positive things you have, not the negative things. It's you know, look, look what I have right here. I don't know. I listen. I'm a podcast junkie, but uh, someone said, you know, start like that. So they said, start out every morning and say to yourself, it's going to be a great day. So I just got me a little post-it, stuck it right here on my, on my uh, monitor. So I see it every morning and I think, you know what, you just got to remind yourself, not that I think it's ever going to be bad, but sometimes I just look over and think, ah, and it is a good day. Whatever works for you. Yep. That's it. That that's Next the secret. Question. Works for you. There's nobody has a formula for everybody. Exactly. Right. What works for you, try it again. Next question. All right. This is from Paula. She said to everyone, longtime listener to your entertaining podcast. I have a question that I can't seem to find the answer to. What became of the missing Lufthansa robbery money? I don't know if I said that name. Lufthansa. Lufthansa money. Lufthansa. See, I, I need to get out more so I know all this. Well, no, you 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 weren't even born during that. <laughs> <laughs> that, that that's Burke. Right. Tell but, me what Lufthansa is. Lufthansa is an airline which was one of the largest heists in JFK and went in down in history. history. Yeah, in American history. And uh, it seemed to be... I mean, they've made movies about it, but it, 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 I, I happen to date his daughter, so I was very close to him. <laughs> Whose daughter? Uh, Burke. Oh, oh, Jimmy Burke. Well, that's, yeah. Well, oh. yeah, well, d- 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 well if you know Lufthansa, you know Jimmy Burke committed, committed the crime. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, well, I know, but I'm thinking some of our viewers might not know who he was, so now we know. The oh, thing yeah. was, uh, Lufthansa was an organized crime heist that was depicted in the movie Goodfellas. They got away with it's it's disputable what they got away with, but around seven million dollars. So the person who asked this question, it's a good question because what did become of that money? What do you think, Johnny? Oh, I know what happened to it. Nobody got paid every time he arranged for them to come and get it. He killed that next person. Yeah, right. I know that. Yeah, they're all dead. And then Jimmy died. I could tell you where the money is, but I'm not going. Tell me where the money is. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> is it in? Is it in Utah? That's what she wants. To know. Oh no, no, it's, it's not it's not in the Mormon bank. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the J- Jimmy Burke. That was Robert De Niro's part. They they called him uh, Conway in the movie. And for anybody who wants to know, it's a useless fact. But the the, the name Conway was his adopted mother's maiden name. So they they used it in the movie. But uh, like Johnny said, he whacked everybody that was involved in that heist, and there was many people involved in that heist. Not right. only on the scene, the people who set it up, people who were supposed to get rid of evidence, and you know, you, you, you pull a robbery or any kind of a job, you divide up the spoils. Sure. Well, Jimmy was a bit greedy, and when you came to him for your cut, you got whacked. Oh, geez, seven million dollars? About. Yeah. Give well, it, I think it was a little bit more. Yeah, give it. Well, who cares? Right? Yeah, it's for nothing. 
if you got it in bags, who cares? <laughs> yeah, uh, and it's, it was the largest uh, heist up until that time in American history, it was in the seventies. But anyway, no. yeah, yeah, people ask me that not all the time, but anytime organized crime comes up, hey, what about the Lutanza money? I said, well, the last guy standing was Jimmy Burke. Yeah. So he's got to have it somewhere. Uh, you know, oh, somebody's got it uh, because he he died in prison uh, thanks to Henry Hill. She stayed with that daughter of his. It sounds like the money might have been in that corner, Johnny. <laughs> no, I, no, I know Kathy well. No, but then, let's okay, walk uh, away from that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, All right. Next story. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Time oh. for a All commercial. Right. Time oh, time for, oh, yeah, we need that. We don't have the little time. Yeah, money, so we got to go on a commercial. And <laughs> right. yeah. We'll be right back. And remember, we know where you live. So we'll come looking for you. Corleone Vodka on March 9th was picked as the best vodka for martinis in the world by the Rob Report. By calling 518-713-4050 or 518-220-9463, it could be shipped directly to your house. The finest vodka in the world by Rob Report. All right, we're back. Give us a little more, Jeannie. What do we got? More I'm questions. So sorry. Okay, sorry about that. All right. This question is from Ralph. And he said, the addition of Jeannie to the pod podcast as a co-host is an excellent, excellent choice. She adds a lot to the show and is a lot prettier than you guys. How did you find her? <laughs> Hello. Yeah, right. Well, that's easier to find somebody Thank pretty than us. But yeah. she is definitely pretty, and and I, we agree that you agree because uh, it was a hard choice to make, and um, but the energy and and she she's a lot of input, and that's what we wanted. So and she's spontaneous, and we thank God you all like her. So we're getting yeah. all sort of vibes back, and God bless you. Yeah, that uh, you know we 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 called for uh, videos a while back. Uh, a couple of four, maybe five months ago, and uh, Jeannie's rose to the top, and here she is. Yep. Well, thank you. You know, I think I might have snuck something in there. I did mine in sepia tone so I could catch Gianni's eye because I uh, knew he did. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you could tell very much, but I'm like, I'm going to throw a little, little something in there. Okay. Uh, you, you want you, you want to tell uh, Johnny tell the audience how a uh, sepia uh, fi fi sepia film relates to what she just said. Well, the sepia well it gives it. Well, I'm in sepia tone. Yeah. So if you watch the show, I'm in a sepia tone, which was the original idea for Francis Ford Coppola to shoot The Godfather in sepia tone because he wanted that old tinge to it, and uh, I happened to do my. I mean, we're really getting to something now. I did my screen test on 14 millimeter mag stripe film, which happened to be old, and it came out sepia tone. So you they didn't. No, I didn't have no idea about it. Yeah. I was a novice. I was, you know, 26 years old. My yeah. ego would be in the movie. And fortunately, they passed my screen test all around Paramount. So everybody knew me, but that was, they didn't want to go that way. But at least I got all the attention I wanted. And here I am talking about it 52 years later. I guess, you know, when you do screen tests, I've, I've heard of uh, actors trying to get parts that show up in character. Oh, everywhere. You know, everybody does everything. It's crazy. To try. When you're out for a part like that, I mean, we didn't even know how big the film was going to be. But, you know, if you determine, you try every angle you can. Unfortunately, the, here we are again. And, you know, I've taken it way beyond film business. and branding and everything else but it's all good thank god yeah that sepia tone worked for you and it worked for me i'm still in it yeah we well, you, you should put a little red light on your on your white wall and you're being i know that's what i told my sister i said i look like i'm uh get, all i need is a light and i look like i'm being interrogated but yeah. Yeah. all right this is from susan to patrick I recently passed the entrance, entrance exam for the NYPD. My hope is to one day be the unit that investigates organized crime. Any career advice? Yes. Don't take the job. No, I'm only kidding. No, no, no. no. Well, I, I, 
uh, congratulations uh, on your career choice. Uh, I want to go into how difficult it is to be a police officer, but you asked the question about uh, investigating or being a unit that investigates organized crime. In the NYPD, that's called the Organized Crime Control Bureau, and uh, you get into any specialized unit, but particularly a unit like that, which is a huge unit given the size of organized crime. Naturally, they don't only investigate Italians. I mean, any ethnic organized crime, any kind of organized crime. Organized crime is defined as three or more people in an ongoing criminal enterprise. So imagine something like that going on in New York. You need a lot of cops. So what they're looking for is uh, police officers who have some experience on the street. That's number one. Probably anywhere from three to five years. On the lower end of it, three years, that time on the street has to be exceptional, which means you make quality arrests. It's the only thing they can judge you on. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, not going sick often, not having a lot of civilian complaints, but the more active you are, which, uh, comes down to arrests and that they're not looking for you arresting organized crime people. They're looking for people that have street smarts. And when you make arrests, you need them. Unless somebody walks up to you on the street and says, officer, I did it. Other than that, you have to know enough to spot somebody that has a concealed weapon, for example, those collars, those arrests uh, show uh, initiative. And that's what they're looking for. So they'll take you in as a police officer rank, which is a silver shield. You know, you see cops with their you know, regular badges and they'll keep you in uh, OCCB on a trial basis. And exactly how long that is. It depends on what the volume of, uh, of work is, but it could be a, a, a year, maybe two, and they see how you perform. And if you perform well, uh, you get promoted to detective third grade, which is the coveted gold shield, and you're in. So in uh, answer to your question, uh, you got to make a lot of arrests, or not even a lot of arrests, quality arrests. They don't have to be a lot. I mean, anybody can go out and arrest a bunch of drunk drivers. I mean, I'm, you just I have to cat. say last night and it's, it's ironic that this question came up or this conversation even come up as uh, we're recording the show October 12th yesterday being 9-11 I was part of and very happy to be a part of it I was part of a, a MC for the Lem Foundation Joe Lem was um, a decorated police officer during 9-11 went to Afghanistan, came back, and then unfortunately died of his ground duty on 9-11. And last night, I've never seen so many commanders and past commissioners in one room just to show the brotherhood. And uh, I was fortunate enough last night to leave there and, and got $10,000 donated to their foundation again. But um, and and it's so funny, so many of them, like I always joke about it. Two or three guys came to me, which I even said to you, Pat, a couple of times. They said, we always knew you were doing something wrong. We tried to arrest you so many times, <laughs> but we could never do it. I was laughing because I heard that so many times by cops. It's funny. Well, that, well, well that's how you, you and I met when I started talking to you about the book. I know. That's what makes me laugh. You know me. I said, everybody knew you. They just couldn't grab you. <laughs> you know? uh, but the, yeah, the, the police department is, uh, and any any uh, any civil service job that that requires you getting hurt or killed, the brotherhood and sisterhood is extremely tight. You know, uh, you depend on the cop next to you, and they depend on you. And sometimes those bonds are, are, are tighter than they are with, with individual families and or civilian friends. Yeah, you know, yeah. so. Uh, uh, but getting advanced uh, on, on the job through investigatory means, not civil service. Civil service, you take exams and you go through sergeant, lieutenant, captain. Like I, I retired as a lieutenant. You have to take written exams, oral exams, what they call inbox exams, all, all kinds of interviews. But if you want to be a detective, it's all about activity. Uh, quality of arrests. And I can't emphasize that enough. So this young lady who came on the job, you're going to have to have the smarts and the, 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 the street smarts to make those quality arrests. And it's not something you learn. It's something that's innate. You just know it. 
Just feel- a word to the wise. Be careful. It's dangerous out there now. Yeah, it's quite dangerous out there. But uh, I wish I wish you luck. Yeah. Moving on. Moving on. This is from Whitey. Is Whitey Bolzer still around? Yes. Oh, no, somewhere. In our dreams. Yeah, he's he's one of our subscribers, by the way, uh, Whitey. <laughs> Maybe Whitey wrote us this. I don't know. Let's see what it says. That'll help us tell. Maybe you can settle an argument between me and a friend. There's Has there ever been a capo in the mafia that didn't have a crew under him? I recall many years ago reading about a guy who owned a restaurant in Queens who was such a person. My friend says I'm crazy. Can you settle this dispute from Ed? I don't know one captain that has no crew under I do. I do. Now I got to be careful. No, no. No, Let's let's not get into it. No, 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 no. You won't be able to figure it out. But uh, this person made, made the rank because he was a tremendous earner, mm-hmm. and I mean big money. So they, they gave him the, the rank of capo, which is a captain. It was just an honorary thing. They've done that so many times. Yeah, yeah. it's an honorary thing. It's, 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 it, it, it shows respect, but what they're not necessarily respecting the person. They're respecting the money. The money that comes in every Sunday as a gift, that's all it is. Yeah, this guy, I can go so far as to say he owned a restaurant which is no longer in existence. But uh, it surprised me, too, because, you know, if, if you have that uh, idea about what a gangster looks like, this guy was just the opposite. You know, when somebody told me uh, his uh, credentials, I was shocked. And well, you know, everybody, you know, there's so many guys out there that want to be a part of that life. Yeah. It's crazy. And when, when they own a restaurant, they want that that monarchy so that people come in and spend the money because they, you know they they they're in in the group i mean it's crazy anyway so, I, I, I hate even talking about that stuff yeah but anyway, that's the only person that I, that I knew of i haven't seen the guy in 30 years so i don't even know where he is now if he's still around that that could happen yes whoever that question was it could happen it's how much money you do you given to the cause on sundays <laughs> yeah right. or you know you're considered an earner that's the highest accolade you can get in the mob. Okay, Jeannie. All right. So there you All go. Right. That's a definite maybe. It's a yeah. little confusing, but I'd say it's a yes, right? In the end. Right. Yes. It's a, yes. It's a definite. <laughs> yes. All right. To Gianni and Patrick, I live in southwestern Pennsylvania. At one time, there was a big organized crime presence in the area up until the late 1980s. Would you consider doing a show on this topic? Do you know any books on the subject? And well, we, we tried. Uh, I and yes, there is a book, and this is how I uh, approached the author. The author his name is Dennis Marsili, M A R S I L L I, uh, and he wrote a book. And I don't have it in front of me because I didn't know the question was coming up. But uh, you can uh, you can run his name through Amazon. He wrote a detailed book, and it's very detailed. And, quite big about organized crime in Southwestern PA, which was extensive. And they were basically connected to uh, 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 Harrisburg. Uh, who, who's the guy, Gianni, who ran Pennsylvania? I forgot his name. Buffalino? Buffalino. Uh, I don't know how I know that. but <laughs> I, You probably read it somewhere. Yeah. Uh, Russell Buffalino ran Pennsylvania and naturally everything uh, uh, west of Harrisburg. The, uh, southwestern Pennsylvania is right on the border of uh, Ohio and West Virginia. Uh, it was right in the corner there. Big, big organized crime presence. Even when I moved here, which was in the early 90s, 92, I think it was, uh, there was organized crime here. Now, Buffalino dies and no one cares. Uh, they're still it's open it's an open territory there now very open uh, you know if, if you want to put uh, uh gambling machines joker poker machines in bars if you'd wanted to do that in new york chicago any place with this mob presence you had to get permission you had to have an agreement who gets what cut here you can you can go out and buy joker poker machines and put them any bar you want and no one's coming near you so is there an organized crime presence there still is there's about two guys <laughs> uh, one is the captain of the crew and the other guy's the crew 
I mean, there's nobody. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're in they're in uh, Pittsburgh, which is close to here, of course. But there, there's no juice. There's no power. So anybody that wants to get involved with gambling or prostitution could just like hang out the shingle. They're in business. Wow. But anyway, get Dennis's next, book. Next year, there'll be a big capital of crime because all the, yeah, all the wannabes are moving in right now. Uh, in fact, it, it, this area, not that it has to do uh, too much with organized crime, except maybe for gambling, uh, was was a big area for pool hustlers. The gamblers used to flock here to, to bet on pool. If you saw the movie The Hustler, Jackie Gleason, Paul Newman, if you haven't, you're missing one of the greatest movies ever made, second to The Godfather, of course. It opens in a, in a small town in Pennsylvania, the Paul Newman character and his partner was played by Myron McCormick. How do I remember this stuff? Anyway, they're passing through southwestern PA on their way to New York to meet Minnesota Fats. But they decide to stop in a pool room to hustle a couple of people because they're running out of money. The scene is maybe five minutes long. That was shot in this town where I live. This, one. this was a big, big gambling pool hustling area back in the day, but it had nothing to do with organized crime. Moving and, on. Moving on. All right. All right. This is from Ted. Over the years, I've read about mobsters who serve as bodyguards to crime family bosses. Logically, bodyguards need to be armed to perform their jobs effectively. Why aren't these guys searched by police and arrested? Because of who they're around and their, their boss are paying the police in the well, area. Well, it goes a little bit further than that because they could be traveling somewhere. They say if the, these guys, uh, you know, b big boss goes from Staten Island to uh, upstate New York somewhere. He's got armed bodyguards. You can arrest anybody you want. I mean, any any cop can go up to one of the bodyguards, search them, undoubtedly come up with a gun. But according to the Constitution, I believe it's the Sixth Amendment, uh, or is it the fourth? One of those numbers. Uh, it's a violation of search and seizure laws. The law, the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution. You have to have reasonable grounds to search. Uh, now, you can pat somebody down. That's not a search. A pat down is over the close. If, you're, if you suspect your life is in danger or your safety is in danger, you can pat down. You can search somebody if you reasonably suspected that they committed a crime. They say, well, why don't the cop just say, hey, my, I felt my life was in danger. Judges have heard this all, uh, and they will throw it out in a heartbeat. So rather than an a, a, a individual police officer be made a fool of, they just don't make the arrest. Let's just, if they see a gun, of course, different story. But uh, And, of course, what Gianni said is true also. Depending on where you are, there could be, uh, you know, the, the Christmas envelopes takes care of everything for the whole mm -hmm. year. Uh, but it's 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 uh, generally nobody no cop wants to look like an idiot in court. Plus, they can get jammed up for doing that. Hello. They keep, they keep losing cases. No, not only really that, they'll be losing sleep at night too. Hello. Well, yeah. you know, getting back to the to, to the previous question, you know, somebody that wants to be a detective wants to make a lot of arrests. You keep losing in court. It's yeah. like you didn't make the arrest to begin with, and you look a, a little bit like a fool. Right. So they generally let these guys alone for that reason. Yeah. Well, I would think if I had a bodyguard, I'd probably want them packing heat. So, oh, yeah. Well, you know, you rarely see a uh, a bodyguard with a slingshot, you know. <laughs> I mean, guys got, guys got to carry guns or at least have them in cars, that, you know, wherever you are. There's no such thing as a bodyguard. But I can see, like, you know, uh, coming out of court, used to see pictures of John Gotti every time he, he won a case, which was often. He'd be surrounded by bodyguards. So they were unarmed. You know, from no, the they're all, all unarmed. Yeah, you know, I mean, it, you, you know, you're in court. Number one, yeah, yeah, you know, you know that. But uh, it, it's just, uh, you know, for that, for the, the reason I mentioned. That's why they're not searched. All right, this is from Angela. She said, "I recently watched a documentary on Prime called The Lynchpin of Bensonhurst: The Life of Dominic Monte Monte Tiglio." Montiglio. All right. Montiglio. We all watched it. <laughs> I'm going to get all these. Pretty soon I'm going to be almost speaking Italian here when I get all these. Have to use when, your hands when you grow a mustache, then you will see that. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I used well, to get caputo, do so I, I've got a little, a little bit of a, Italian. So, all right. Um, highly recommended. 
there are a few references made to a woman known as Susie Cream Cheese, a notorious mob mob mall. There is no reference to her on the internet. Do you guys know of her? I met her, but that doesn't mean anything. She hung out. That's what she was at the Gemini all the time. She was Susie in the neighborhood Cream. girl. What what's the, how did you pick that name? Good question. Like everybody had nicknames. That's all. Like if they called you Genie Ice Cup, but who cares? I mean, that was your nickname in the neighborhood because you didn't use your real names. I got you. All right. Generally, somebody gives you a name and it just sticks. You know, it That's could be all. anything. She could have been eating a cream cheese and jelly sandwich, and somebody just said, "Hey, yeah. Susie, cream cheese sounded good." So no, they always give you something that's attached to you, so people know who they're talking about. Yeah, yeah. and all the wiretaps don't. Yeah, <laughs> that's what it's about, basically. Until I figure it out, you know. But, yeah. Uh, this guy uh, Dominic Montiglio uh, was in the Roy DeMeo crew, as Johnny said. They hung out in the, in the uh, G Gemini Lounge. This is a great documentary, and, and those of you who listen to this podcast know that I'm not a great fan of documentaries because they're always one sided. Because somebody else is telling the story, uh, the 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 writer, the producer, the director, whatever is narrating. And they all have uh, uh, something to say. This documentary, the entire documentary was Montiglio talking about his past. It's on, I believe it's on Prime. It's, it's either on Netflix or Prime. The Lynchpin of Bensonhurst. Right. It yeah. is great. Watch it. It's very good. Now, I called Gianni about this. And I said, we got to get this guy on the show. Uh, and he said, yeah, let's let's do it. Well, kind of difficult. He's dead. Because he died. Dad, he died the week before. Oh, <laughs> He died right when the documentary was released. What about the cream cheese? Can can we hunt her down? You can never find her now. She's yeah. probably dead by now anyway. Yeah, Susie must be. Well, he talked about his life in the 70s and 80s, so Susie must be way up there now. Oh, yeah. Probably uh, very senile now. They call her sour cream now. <laughs> <laughs> or, Susie, or Susie Pablum or something. But uh, her, her cream cheese days are over. Uh, yeah. All right. All yeah. right. I don't know. She might be living living large somewhere. All Maybe. right. This, this is for Patrick and Gianni, and it's from David. It says, I know this question has been asked, but I'm asking it from a different perspective. What's your favorite Italian restaurant of all time? Not just for the food. So is there a place you guys go? You like the atmosphere? Food's Not me, no. You know, that, that's, I'm, I'm, I'll only speak for myself. Those days are over in New York. It's, yeah. it's a shame. It really is a shame because, I mean, you know, we would love to go out, love to dine out. My cousin has probably the best two restaurants. If I go out, I'll go see him because he's he's my cousin, and his restaurants are still jamming. But I really don't go out anymore. Man. I mean, you know, I'm in my eighties. I, I have what I have in my house, and people come here. I, I don't want to go out there. It's a crazy world out there right now. All I could do is get in trouble, you know, because I wear a lot of jewelry and try to take it off, man. I'm going to be in trouble. <laughs> well, I actually have two. One John Johnny is uh, familiar with, Il Caminetto. It's on, not uh, even open anymore. No, it's closed a long time, but I'm saying, oh, that, my favorite it's Italian. I like I wanted to go eat. I didn't know. <laughs> no, no, I'm just, no, the question is the way I. Of all time, um, yeah. It's, it's, it's a favorite Italian restaurant. For other than the food, the food in the Il Caminetto, as you know, Gianni, was excellent. Uh, oh, yeah, but, but that's, again, uh, when we used to go and everybody yeah. wanted to go see who's there and who's showing up. I mean, it was it was an event to go to these places. I mean, you go in, first of all, you never knew who you were going to meet. This is where I met John Gotti uh, over several times. We we talked usually about clothes. I mean, we wouldn't talk about anything else. But uh, you never know who you're going to meet. And it was like a social atmosphere because you kept on seeing the same people. Yeah. So I was in El Caminero, uh, if not every Saturday, like every other Saturday. Yeah. And uh, it, it was it was an experience. And the other place, as strange as this sounds, was an Italian restaurant in Hong Kong. Oh, wow. Uh, I was you, in Vietnam for almost a year. And they Hong give you some Kong. <laughs> Hong Kong. Listen to this. Is it the only <laughs> one in Hong Kong? Well, yeah, it is the only one. Hello. They give you, uh, the, the army gives you something called R&R, &R, Rest and Recuperation, if you, you're allowed uh, a five-day R&R out of the country. So I was waiting, uh, holding off and holding off. Usually about you're halfway through the tour, like six months through. They say, pick a place. You can get the, the popular places were Hawaii and uh, 
Bangkok, Thailand. And I wanted to go to Hawaii because, well, there's Americans. One, it probably, you know, we, we're eating out of cans for a year, you know. So uh, I, I wanted Hawaii, but so did everybody else. And I was only a, 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 a sergeant. And the, all the officers weren't there. So it's getting to be the end of my tour in Vietnam. And I had to go somewhere. Otherwise, I was going to lose the R&R. &R. And it's all paid for. They pay for the hotels and everything. So I went to Hong Kong. The first thing you do is you buy an escort. But you're 50 bucks a night. Can you believe this? $50 a night is yours for the week. I wanted and, to make sure you said she, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, I, what do I know about Hong Kong? I didn't, I didn't even know there was two islands to Hong Kong. I knew nothing about Hong Kong. Just wanted to get the hell out of Vietnam. So my first question to her was, she was a college student. So she was, she was learning English. Uh, and, she, and she spoke it pretty well. But she said, I, I was at a Italian restaurant. She says, Joe's Italian restaurant. I looked at her. <laughs> I said, is, there, is it a real Italian restaurant? She said, oh, yeah. What up? Really? It's great. I said, I think it's great because it's the only one in Hong Kong. So I went there. Joe's Italian restaurant. Very plush. Everybody's Chinese. The waiters, the cooks, the bartenders, everybody. And I said, I don't think I'm in for a treat here. <laughs> I don't know if it was because I hadn't eaten any Italian food in almost a year. But the food was phenomenal. And uh, I don't know if I'd be saying that now, but I ate there every night for the five days I was there with my date. Uh, I mean, there's so many nice places, and, and Hong Kong is a beautiful city. But uh, I was uh, I, I didn't want to go anywhere else. So I still have very fond memories of the place, and it's still open. I check. Tell that guy to go to Hong Kong, I asked, and he'll go have yeah. fun. Yeah, there you go. I was. I'm not. I'm not doubting your recommendation that it's the best, but. You left Vietnam. Hello. McDonald's would have been <laughs> fabulous, wouldn't it? And he, and he yeah. did say eating out of cans. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. There's a lot of key words here you got to right, learn. Right. How yeah, good it was. And, you know, if, if we were in an okay area, they, they would fly in hot meals, but everything was reconstituted, you know, uh, powdered eggs, powdered potatoes, pow you know, and for the rest of the time you're eating, you're, you're eating uh, sea rations, you know, so I, I would imagine anything tastes good. But for the nostalgic point, from the right, nostalgic point of view, Joe's was it, and it's still there. So. That's wow. awesome. I love that. Anyway. Love that. All right. Let me see. It's our last one. Dang it. I have so much fun. I look forward to this all week. All right. In fact, I asked someone today, I said, have you seen the movie The Godfather? And he said, what's the matter with you? He said, you mean, how many times have I seen it? About 10. That's all? Okay. Yeah, I, I, all right. I'll get to it. He's, he's kind of a young guy, so I, I let him go. All right. So, so that's, that's it for the questions. This is, that is it for the last questions? one. What oh, last one. Yes, so this is the last question. It's from Jessica, and it's to Pat and Gianni. It says, it's always been said that if you betray the mob, you'll get they'll get you no matter where you hide. How were the very public lives of Henry Hill and Sammy Gravano ignored by the mob? They lived their lives publicly, and no one bothered them. Because the mob was getting out of the business, then nobody cared. They knew where sin. They knew where all of them are, but yeah. nobody. Who's going to go get them now? I mean, yeah. you're going to go to Arizona. I mean, it's it's craziness. No, no I mean, you know that, and you're 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 creating news. You know, uh, and, and you know somebody tried that. We Johnny and I discussed this on the show. A a a, a hit team went to get uh, Sammy the Bull after he left the witness protection program and opened up an Italian restaurant in Arizona to a lot of fanfare. He was in a lot of media, and somebody asked him that question. Aren't you afraid that somebody's going to come and get you? And he said, let him come. Yeah. So uh, three guys went from Jersey. Well, three guys tried to go to Arizona. They, they drove, and they got picked up halfway there. Long story short, they're all doing life, including one of the hitters who was a uh, a Newark Police Department lieutenant. But how did they get life on what? I never heard that one. What was their charges? Uh, attempted murder, uh, lying to the FBI. Okay, they got life. This is a federal crime. So I don't know how the feds treat it. I know what I'm just saying. Okay, I mean, crossing straight line. Yeah, they're still in. Uh, it's, it's been, what, 25 years? They're still in. That's when, you get, when you get life... Uh, with the feds, it's natural life. 
No, but what I'm saying is, I know what. I mean, what are charged with? Who no, knows? I'm saying, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm driving across the state line. They pull me over. I got six guns in the car. I don't get life. No, no, but it was uh, it was attempted. I don't know how they got it, but you can you know you can ch check it out on the internet. It's definitely there. Oh, I don't know. Really what, what exactly the charges? That's were. the last thing I want to do on the internet. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, <laughs> anybody who's for anybody who's uh, listening to this, what the exact charges are, I don't know. Well, I know the reason it stuck out was because one of them was a cop and a ranking cop at that. Uh, that was one of the hitmen. Wow. Uh, and Gravano said, you know, bring them on. Like like Johnny said, who wants to do that? Now, the mob doesn't have that kind of desire anymore. Why should they? People well, don't I'm, talk I'm, anyway. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that as an expert. You know, how many times I've been threatened by mobsters from every city in the world after they, who lost 10,000 in my club and this, that, and the other. You don't know who I am. You know how many times I heard you don't know who I am? I said, you're right. I don't know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. And I'm still there. <laughs> and I'm not a tough guy. Well, they, no, all the problems you had they say, well, we're going to come in there, but you'll kill us. <laughs> all the problems you had with uh, Spolotro is a perfect Hello. example. Hello. I'm still here. You're still here. And you're not going anywhere. I mean, I mean, I could name heavy guys. We know that. How many? Uh, Pablo Escobar. I went down to see him. I'm still here. You've got you've got a great memory, Gianni. Thank but God. Just, just yeah. be careful crossing the street. That's I don't right. cross the street. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is, is that it, Gianni? That's it. All right. Well, I have one more question. Can I ask you a question? Ask any I, question you want, my darling. It's from my sister, and she said uh, to ask you, and I said, you need to write an email. And then I said, I'll sneak one in, but from now on, you go do the emails. But and what's your said, sister's name? So her name is Janica, and she's very excited. She's going to get her notebook out, and she will be sending us stuff often, I think, because she's please. she likes this stuff. But she said she had just seen something on – TV about someone called White Boy Rick. Yeah. Is that familiar? Yeah. Not to me. Who is he? Well, white Boy Rick was a, hard to believe, a white boy that was dealing drugs with a black crew in Jersey. They made a movie about him called, oddly enough, White wow. Boy Rick. And uh, it was out about maybe seven or eight years ago. He, he's another one that got a, a huge amount of time, uh, 40 years and uh, it, it was federal time, and he did every day of it. And he he got out fairly recently, maybe in the last last two years. But he he was he was the only white guy with this black crew. That's right. That's I forgot the, there was. That's a... what that's what he was known as. You can probably find the movie either on YouTube or one of the streaming services. And what and what's the what's the movie about? A white guy selling it's drugs. About a young white kid who uh, not that he had a you know, just an average white kid going to school with an average family. Decided he wanted to start dealing drugs. He got into the hip hop scene, whatever it was, with these black guys, and he oh. said, "This is where the money's going to be made." And he was a a, a, a trusted guy with this gang, oh, and uh, gang. he got oh. locked up and got heavy time. He wouldn't flip. I thought he had something to do with the mob, so that's what. Well, that, well it is the mob. It was oh. a mob, and this is and not the Italian mob. Not the Italians. Yeah. All right. Well. Another great show. I enjoyed it anyway. I, I love the mailbag. Hearing, hearing from all of you out there, please send in more cards and letters, more suggestions for shows. That's why we got the material, and that's why our audience keeps building, fortunately, and uh, we thank you for that. Okay. Good night, Gianni. It was a great show. Good night, Jeannie. Good, Good night. night, Jeannie. Thank you, my love. Thank uh, you. Talk to you tomorrow. Okay. Nighty night, everybody. Good night. Bye-bye. that but i'll be back thank you for tuning in to the hollywood godfather podcast want to ask us a question for the mailbag we love hearing from our fans so submit your questions online at hollywoodgodfatherpodcast.com or you can give us a call at 646-776-3038 and leave a message Contact us anytime with your questions about past or future shows, your favorite celebrity, or anything you'd like to know. And who knows, your question may even make it on the air. 
Remember to follow us on Instagram and on Facebook at Hollywood Godfather and at Real Johnny Russo. If you like what you hear, please leave us a review with your podcast provider or your video streaming service. We'll be back next week with another exciting show and who knows who we may have on the show. If you don't want to miss out on an episode, remember to subscribe. Until next time. My life's like scenes out of a movie. I'm the Hollywood Godfather, truly. I got stories with them all. You know, celebrities, world leaders, icons. Who knows what's next for me? I'll never get too old to have a little fun. Come on, I'm Gianni Russo. A genuine one of a kind. What a ride it's been, this life of mine. And I ain't done yet. I'll be back until next time. And that was that. When I was seventeen, it was a very good year. It was a very good year for small town girls. And soft summer nights We'd hide from the light On the village green When I was seventeen I didn't mind Waiting